Hello and welcome back to Redefine Parenting. I'm your host, Vinu Keller, and I want to welcome you to Spanglish World Network and her network on Zingo TV's channel 250 and 251. Please remember to download both the Zingo TV app on respective app stores on iOS and Android devices. While you download, make sure to rate and leave a comment. The app is free. Zingo TV is also available on Google Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Fire Sticks, Roku, Roku Sticks, and all smart TVs 2016 and forward. So tonight I have a very special guest, someone who I have admired from a distance, and now I get to be in his company personally to have him on my show. Uh, Sid Jacobson, thank you so much for taking your time to come into our realm of redefined parenting and really kind of share your expertise. I know you're an NLP expert. You train people to be NLP experts. And more so recently, I've noticed that you have moved into the whole, you know, teaching kids on how to learn. And that's really why I wanted to bring you on because your vast knowledge and what you have learned and experienced throughout your years and what you've been able to give to the world. And now, you know, we have a little synergy going on because it's now about how are we as parents going to redefine the way we parent? And one of the things we need to know is how do we teach our children even how to learn? by what we're teaching them. So without further ado, Sid, welcome to our show. Thanks very much, Vino. It's great to be with you. I appreciate it. So let's dive in. Let's dive into like what this all means when we're saying let's teach our children how to learn. Well, let's go back a little bit. You said that this is, um, you hinted almost that this is sort of recent for me and this is old for me. I've been doing this since the 70s. So. Wow. I got into NLP in, I learned about it in 1977 and got into it in 1978. So when I got my master's degree in social work, I went to work in a family service agency. Now I had already worked in three prisons, two psychiatric hospitals and a community mental health center. So I had a lot of experience in the mental health field. And a lot of that was with kids. One of those psychiatric hospitals, uh, I spent a year and a half with some of the most difficult adolescents you can imagine with every kind of problem, uh, and many of them, a number of different kinds of charges <laughs> that you can possibly imagine. So it was very difficult work. And when I went into the social work agency I was working in, uh, something really interesting happened. Now I had just had a week of NLP training. And for those people who don't know what NLP is, let me real briefly describe. So a couple of guys named Richard Bandler and John Grinder were researchers at the University of California at Santa Cruz. It's just south of San Francisco, about an hour's drive. It's a wonderful university. And they were interested in how people influence each other. And in studying psychotherapists, salespeople, teachers, doctors, lawyers, a number of other people in their communication skills and how they were able to get people to make changes, they discovered a number of patterns in language, in body language, in the ways that people think, the way that they communicate with each other, and develop this field called NLP. And I won't go too much deeper into it for right now, but I'll give you little bits and pieces as we talk. So I just had a week of training with these guys, with Richard and John and their wives, uh, Judy Delosier and Leslie Cameron Bandler. And so uh, and that was the, the second NLP practitioner program that they had ever done. So this was in early 1978. And it was my second NLP workshop because I had one earlier in 1978. So I was all jazzed in starting this new job in the social services agency. And one of the things that, that we had to do was help kids who were having trouble in school. And this was my experience. Parents would drag their child into the office point and say, it's, it's broken, Sid, would you fix it, please? And then just let us know and give it back when you're done. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes they would actually bring in a, a ream of papers, of reports and scores and, you know, testing and, and all kinds of things, some of which was really interesting, but not always that useful. So I started just doing what I'd learned how to do, which was paying special attention to how these kids thought how they felt, what their experiences were inside. And one of the things that I discovered was, even though they were always dragged into my office for some sort of behavioral issue, like they weren't behaving in the classroom properly, almost always there was something underneath that. 
it was very, you know, obvious right away that these kids were either frustrated or there was something going on in the home that needed to be dealt with, or they had some kind of learning problem. Mm -hmm. And I decided to see what I could do about the learning problems. Now, I had no background in educational psychology at all. In fact, when I was in school, I was going to take a course in educational psychology. And the guy teaching the course told me it was too dumbed down for me. Don't take this course. It's, this is for people who, you know, don't worry about this. You don't need this. You're the real deal. You go take the other courses. And I went, oh, okay. So I actually never had a course in educational psychology. And what I discovered was most of those courses were built around child development. You know, what do you need to know as kids are developing? What kinds of thinking can they do? What kinds of emotional experiences do they have? All of which is fine, but does you no good if all of a sudden this child doesn't know how to spell? Right. right. Or is having a reading problem or can't do math or takes a history class and doesn't remember anything, right? So I decided I'm going to do something about this. And I just started exploring because here was the deal. I was actually being asked to do something to help the kid change their behavior and just send them back. And my program director was actually quite angry with me. He said, look, you, you don't know anything about education. Don't do this stuff. Leave that to the schools. And I would say something like, well, he's been in school for you know 10 years and not getting too far. So you know, couldn't I do something? He says, but you don't know how. And I said, well, let's see. So I started experimenting with asking kids what they were doing. Now, one of the things that we do in NLP is we not only listen for subtleties in language, we watch people's behaviors. So we have a lot of skill, as you know, around reading people. So knowing when people are making images in their mind or when they're talking to themselves or what kind of feelings they're having. And I was doing all this and, and then really establishing good relationships with these kids. And they could tell me, well, this is how I'm thinking about this. And invariably, they were simply doing something that doesn't work. You know, and, and here's our classic example in NLP. You would ask a child, how do you spell this word, whatever it is? And you would watch their eyes go down and they'd start to feel bad. And you'd see them having this conversation inside and then they were trying to sound out the word. Now, there's a built-in problem with that. So I'll give you a word, Vinu. I'll just give you a little test. Spell this word for me. Right. Well, which right? Exactly. That's the problem. There's three of them. It could be R-I-G-H-T. It could be W-R-I-T-E. Or it could be R-I-T-E, like a rite of passage, right? So in English, sounding words out doesn't work. Right. You know, people would tell me, oh, no, phonics, is that really works? And I say, okay, give me the sound of a silent E. <laughs> yeah, it's real quiet, right? Or when you look at a word like R-I-G-H-T, how come there's a G and an H? And, I mean, what is this all about? Right. So what we know is and people who taught me had studied people who were really good at spelling. And they found that all good spellers do the same thing. They'll hear a word and remember what the word looks like. And they'll have a picture of the word in their mind. They'll have the image. And they'll simply write down what they see in their head. So it's the easiest thing in the world to teach that to a child. So I just, to, I just want to add something real quick. Because my sure. twin, and it just goes along with what you're saying. So my twins that are now 11... Um, they both have dyslexia when we put them. So when they were born a little premature, because I worked with kids with developmental disabilities, I always knew how to keep my kids on track with their development. So when you ask a parent, when you're understanding a child's, um, abilities or lack thereof, we always go right. to birth history. Tell me about their birth history. Tell me about their developmental needs. And so with all due respect, my kids were, were great. Like they never were behind because I personally worked with them. Right. Then I, but I told my husband, I said, we will know the truth of where they're at when they get to school. 
And in that, when they went to school, when they got to second grade, they were not um, up to par. They were like six levels behind rating. Wow. And we got, went and got them tested. They showed they had some ADHD issues mm -hmm. and dyslexia. And what they said is exactly what you're saying is that their imagery of their brain was not working. It's like a blank chalkboard to them. So I, I feel like I'm speaking your language with what you're describing because yeah. they, fell, they still have problem comprehending it because that dyslexic brain is not putting any imagery. Vinu, just wait. <laughs> Here, here's what I'm going to tell you. So this is this is a perfect example of the kind of stuff that I would hear all the time. And I pretty much cracked the code on dyslexia. Dyslexia is, and, and this is going to freak out a lot of people who are listening. There's a lot of parents out there who have spent a lot of money or have all these diagnoses and stuff. They're not going to like what I'm about to say. That's okay. Dyslexia isn't something you have. It's something you do. It's an active process. Reading is not natural. So let, let's talk about reading for a minute. I was going to do this later, but let's just jump right into reading for a minute. Until a couple of thousand years ago, about 5,000 years ago, when writing was invented, there was no such thing as reading problems because nobody read. There was no writing. There was no reading, right? So here's what we know. To learn a language, take any two-year-old, plunk them down around a bunch of adults, and they're going to learn that language. There is a functional module in our brain. So when we say module, it doesn't mean it's in a place somewhere. But functionally, our brains are built to learn language. We're built for it. Writing is artificial. Hmm. It's something that was invented. There is no place in our brain that is built to learn how to read and write. And every language is written differently. Now, I do a lot of work in China. I mean, I work all over the world, but I do a lot of work in China. How many dialects are there in China? Frankly, I don't even know. But I know <laughs> there's a whole bunch of them. You have Cantonese around Hong Kong. You've got uh, around Beijing, of course, it's Mandarin and, and Shanghai. And there are uh, even northern places. There's something called Hokkien. And there are all these other dialects. And guess what? These aren't dialects in the way that you think of slightly different language. They're completely different languages. Uh, people who speak Hokkien don't even necessarily understand Cantonese or Mandarin. A it's a different language. But guess what? The writing's all the same. They have one writing system. So think about this for a minute. In English, our letters are meant to be sounds. They're meant to mimic what we're saying to each other. So that when you look at the letter B, you go, um, ba. So what words have ba in them? And those are the ones that have a B, right? Chinese doesn't work that way. And in fact, they've got two different writings now. I don't know if you know this. They have traditional and they've got simplified. Most of China uses simplified Chinese. They made it easier because it was so hard, right? In Taiwan, they're still using traditional. It's different writing even, but it's all completely artificial. There are some languages that aren't pictorial like Chinese and they're not sound like English. They're some other system entirely. So, so here's what we know. You can't learn to read and write on your own. Somebody has to teach you to do it. Okay. Because it's not natural. So you have to learn to do it. You have to learn to see those symbols on the page and associate them with something. In English, it's some kind of sound. And then what do we have to do? We got to make meaning out of it. So what does that mean? So when you read something, you're, you're a functioning adult who's very highly skilled and, and knowledgeable. You read something, you're making pictures in your mind of what's on the page. You're hearing the sounds. If you read a novel, it's probably like a movie for you. Right. You can see the characters and hear them. Uh, some people even put in their own music. I have a friend who said he hates to see any movie where he's read the book because his music was always better than the one in the movie. <laughs> and he would always be disappointed, right? But this is how we use our brain. So we have these abilities and we have the ability to learn how to learn language. 
that's built in. We have the ability to learn reading and writing, but that's not built in. It's artificial, it has to be taught. So what happens when we're learning that? Well, learning to read goes through stages, like a lot of things. So here's one of the other things that you need to know. This is, this is just basic psychological theory. Most teachers don't even know this. Human beings are extremely good at making very fine, minute distinctions with practice. Mm-hmm. So the first time you see a D and a B next to each other, you don't make the distinction. After a while, you learn, oh, that's a D, that's a B. That's a Q, that's a P. That's an M, that's an N. That's a W, that's a V, right? There are all these letters that kind of look the same, but they're different. They have different meanings and different sounds, right? But you have to learn that. So here's what happens. While kids are learning that, they are naturally going to make mistakes. They're going to flip things around. Those B's and D's are going to flip around with them. They're not, they haven't learned to make the fine distinction yet in a consistent way. It's like anything else we do. There has to be enough practice before we do it consistently, right? I know you've heard this a million times. Repetition is the mother of skill, right? We have to repeat things over and over again until we get it. Right. So we learn when something works. So here's what happens. And, And I'll tell you how I discovered this. I worked with a lot of adults who had learning problems. Because I, I was doing all these workshops for teachers and for trainers, people who were professional trainers like you. And some somebody would come along and say, well, you know, the problem I have with, with my students, even in, in corporate settings, was some of them don't read so well. Or they have problems with her, so they have dyslexia. And invariably, there would be someone in the room who was di- identified as dyslexic. So being a good NLP trainer like I am, I would always say, come on up here. Let's join me up here on stage. Let's do a little work. Right. And I would explore with them. Now, knowing that people do dyslexia, you want to know what they do. So I watched what they do. So here's what I want you to do with your kids. And anybody out there listening, do this. Child, adult, makes no difference. Hand them a book and ask them to read something. Here's what you will see them do. I'll just pick up a book. Take a deep breath. They'll hold the book up. Too close. Their body will tighten, and they'll start to try to read, usually too fast. Now, why would somebody do that? Well, here's my hallucination about that. Somebody would do that because they feel judged. Like they're going to be judged by the way it comes out. Are they going to get the words right? Is it going to make sense? Is it going to, are they going to understand? So there's a lot of judgment going on before they even get to the what they're going to read. Let me disabuse you of the idea that that's a hallucination because that's exactly what they do. Right. So, so why? So my question was, why would somebody do that? Then the question becomes, well, I wonder where they learned it. Here's where they learned it. Remember when you were learning to read in the classroom, you were in one of two situations, either sitting around in a circle Mm -hmm. or sitting at your desk and everybody in the class took a turn reading the next sentence, right? Yes, I hated it. Until somebody made a mistake. And what are the possibilities when somebody makes a mistake you could have a great loving teacher who says oh that's okay look let me show you again you're doing great isn't that wonderful did that happen in your classroom well i need (laughs) i mean it's we got an abrupt way of saying it but i'll tell you what it did do for me yeah it gave me permission that it's okay to make mistakes because i wasn't the first one who did it Okay. And that, that person's still alive and, is st- and nobody laughed at him. And the teacher just corrected it, like gave him the right word. Not, there was no, oh, you're doing great. It's okay. This is, it's just. Okay. okay. Either one would be fine. This is what happened to every single person, every single one, no exceptions, 100% of you know, 50 or 60 adults I've done this with at least. Every single one of them, when they made the mistake, somebody laughed at them. 
or made fun of them or their teachers scolded them or they got a bad look from somebody. Oh, and what did they one. do? And what did they do? They did this. And reading became this body experience. And what happens at that point is the learning to make fine distinctions gets stuck right there. I'm, I'm curious. Yes, I hear what you're saying. And yes, I've seen it. And yes, I probably got a look or something that made it feel like I didn't do it right. However, what I've noticed, and I could even go back because now you brought me back to my childhood, by the way. So thank you for that. <laughs> Is that when I heard other people read so well, it intimidated me because I already knew that I could not read out loud the way they did. I could read in my head like that, but I could not verbalize the smooth, the inflection of the voice like someone else. So already I started to compare myself. So I didn't want, to, I knew I was not good enough. So that's just as bad. <laughs> right, comparing right. and making yourself not of course how can you be comfortable thinking that about yourself correct right? and, it, and then it stacks right and then it stacks into a lot more issues of i'm not exactly. good enough i don't belong and of course. what have you of course i'm convinced that most people learn all those you know difficult complicated negative messages we call them negative messages about ourselves a lot of them learn those things in school. A lot of them learn it from their families. A lot of them learn it somewhere else. But a and lot of times it, it comes from school. And I would you say know, a lot of from the reading part. What you're saying is describing because we, well, back in my day, we didn't start really reading until we were in first, second grade. Now it's preschool. kindergarten. You know, they, right. they moved up the curb. And right. still, because I'm watching my kids that now do a dyslexia, as you said, and I'm still trying to, wrap my mind around that. So thank you. Um, not angry, just curious. Um, because my husband, Brian, who you know as well, he also has dyslexia. Like we've used this and I'll tell you the school systems do not see dyslexia. I know they, they don't see it. And I have friends that are advocates for their, for their kids. Cause they've gone through it. So I'm right. curious because I know, and I know we're jumping all over the place, but I'm curious. I'm still not understanding if we do it, it's not a dysfunction in the brain. It's not a dysfunction in the brain. I don't think there's anything wrong with the brain. Now, that doesn't mean you can't put them in a functional MRI machine and find some difference in their brain. Sure. Because, but it's also irrelevant because every person I've ever done this with, I've been able to undo the dyslexia in about 15 minutes. If somebody is tightening up their body, holding their breath. But let me let me say it another way. Here's what I used to do with these groups of teachers. I would say, do the following. And I would have them do what I just described. Pick up a book, hold it too tight, bring it too close, tighten your everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> Stomach especially and parts lower especially. Hold your breath. And I would make them hold their breath for about 30 seconds, which some of them couldn't do anyway. And then I let them take a breath or two, hold their breath again, take another breath or two, hold their breath again, hold up the book and try to read. And you know what happened? They all became dyslexic. That's what happened. This is how you do it. Now, here's the other part of it, though. Because people are so uncomfortable doing that, they try to read too fast. Yes. And when you try to read too fast, you're going to make more mistakes. I make mistakes when I read too fast, unless I'm, you know, reading in a particular way where it's okay to read too fast. I have different ways of reading that I've trained myself to do after being told to do that by some people. So, so the trick is to manage the person's state, as you well know. So get them very comfortable. I also have them imagine three or four other things they're really good at and feel good about the, about doing and feel good about themselves for being able to do. So things they feel successful about. So they get into a state where they feel not only comfortable, but capable, where they can enjoy success. They can enjoy what they're doing. Then I do the following. I'll hand them the book again. And I'll make sure that they relax, 
hold the book at a comfortable distance, not too close, because dyslexics try to bring it up too close. And then I ask them to read too slowly. And they'll say, what do you mean too slowly? So slow that you want to speed up, but don't. And you know what? They don't make any mistakes at all. Interesting. So I just took those notes because I'm going to do that with my kids. You're going to be astonished. Because make them read too slowly. Make sure they're comfortable. Make sure they're in a state where they believe they are capable of doing this. So is this like here's, the, here's the other thing too? Let me let me just I'll take your question in a second, but this is real, real important. When people have a problem in some area, they think that's different. They're special in their disability about that. So they'll say, oh, yeah, I'm great at tennis. I'm great at learning math. I'm terrific at history. But reading, I'll never be able to do that because there's something wrong with me. We have to eliminate that notion because as long as somebody has, some, has themselves identified, and you know how important identity is. If somebody has themselves identified as broken or damaged in some way, they're going to operate out of that identity. Right. They're not going to make the change. So we have to get them out of that notion too. So you need to, and you know how to do this. You help your kids believe that there is really nothing wrong with them, that this right. is something they can learn to do well. And there's a lot of research that backs up that this can be done. Nobody else does it the way I do it, but there are other people, you know, usually university-based researchers who tell you they can get any kid to learn how to spell. They can get any kid to learn how to read and they can make all these, these issues go away. I think they're overcomplicating the ways that they do it. The ones that I've seen. If they're successful, more power to them. But I think it's not as complicated as most people think it is. And when I tell you, it's always, in my experience, always somehow trauma-based. There's some sort of discomfort connected to it. The person's belief, their entire thinking about reading is there's something wrong with them. Right. Because, look, they made fun of me. I'm bad. I can't do it. There's something. And, and they have learned to do it that way. And so... They have to learn to read in a new way. I also think, though, Sid, from the time that, so I'm a Gen X kid, right? So I was born and raised in the 70s and 80s. And going into the different generations that we're at now, I think, I mean, I feel like we've always compared. But I think comparison now, especially with social media and parents comparing other people's kids to your kids, it's gotten so far out that they don't even need to be scolded. It's what I was saying is that they're so afraid. Like I'm not like them. So I don't even want to try because right. in their mind, right. they've labeled that is what it looks like. And I know when it comes out of my mouth, it doesn't sound like that. So I'm not even going to try. I'm dumb. Sure. I'm stupid. I don't get it. There's something wrong with me. So kids, I right. think they're already seeing that. So I'm what I'm curious about what you're saying. Cause it makes a lot of sense to me. Is this the fundamentals of what you teach on, like, how do we get kids to learn how to learn? It's one of the fundamentals. Okay. So here's the idea. So going back to, you know, working with all those different kids. So they didn't all have reading problems. They had all kinds of different problems. Sure. And all, you know, everything. There was one who couldn't say the alphabet. He was in seventh grade and he couldn't get through the alphabet. So, and I'll give you him as an example, too, because it's a simple example. Here's what he would do. And say, tell me the alphabet. And he was in special education. He was in seventh or eighth grade. And he'd go, okay, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. I think we all did that. <laughs> yeah. But look where he stopped. Right. At the L, M, N, O, P. Right. And he'd start over. Mm -hmm. And he'd do it again. Start over and do it again. Now, how did you hear my voice as I was doing this? A, B, C. Very Monotone, modern. right? Reading the letters out of the air. So he's got the visual part right. Looking it up, yep. What's wrong with L-M-N-O-P? I don't know, but it was the hardest part of the song to sing. M and N sound almost the same. And that's where he got messed up. And for him... It was really bad because for him, it was a visual problem. They blended together. The M and N looked the same way. They do, so yeah. I taught him to sing the song. But when we got to L-M-N-O-P, slow down. And he did this. 
A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. He moved them apart so he could see them clearly as distinct letters. And when he got to S, he got stuck again. He went X, and you have to go back and start over. He kept saying X for S. Those sound the same, right? So I had him in his mind make a real big S, bigger than all the other letters. And when he got to the X, make a real big X. So it's the visual. In that case, for part of it was auditory, part of it was visual. I had to combine which parts were working for him and which ones weren't till he had the song down and he had the visuals down with it. And he said the alphabet three times right in front of me in his, the office for the first time in his life. So here's what, when you and I were talking about this, um, mm -hmm. and I know, and when I said that recently is the teaching kids to learn was because your book came out, I believe in 2013, but you right. did NLP for so long. So I had written my first book on how to do this in 1979. Wow. It came out, came out in 1983. And then I did two more volumes that came out in 1986 or something like that. So, so that's my fourth book on this. Oh, okay. And this particular one called Teaching Learning is for parents specifically. The older ones were for teachers, parents, and psychologists. Right. And here's what I will say, just from my own experience, because yeah. reading was never my forte either. Um, but I never associated myself with dyslexia or anything like that. I'm still not someone that likes to read. I'd rather listen to the book than read the book. Um, hmm. And... When I studied psychology and I was working with children with developmental disabilities for, I call it my past life because I did it for 20 years before I was a coach. And what I realized with, when you said different ways kids learn, I felt when I, that's when I started to learn that some kids are auditory, some kids are visual and some kids are kinesthetic. And all of a sudden it dawned on me with my own experience that I always hated history because I could not remember the dates. And back in the day when I was growing up, history was all about the year Christopher Columbus came, the year the Boston Tea Party. And when we were tested on it, we had to remember a lot of dates and we had to match them. The only year of history that I enjoyed that I actually can still remember was my sophomore year of high school. My teacher, Mr. Tuttle, taught us about the, the World War II, about dropping the bomb and why. Because we had an mm -hmm. experiential learning where I was actually Harry right. Truman's attorney. Mm. And every day we come to class and we all had our different parts in it. But that's how we learned about the year that the, uh, the, the bomb was dropped and what Truman did. And that's the only really thing that I know who was president at the time and whatnot because of the way that he taught us. We didn't right. have a book that we had to read. I mean, we did because we had to be able to present our case because I was the attorney. Sure. Sure. And I was like, that made such a difference to me. Of course. Because it wasn't sitting there reading, highlighting, taking notes, like the typical way we learned how to learn back in my day. It was the experience. It was fun. Of course. It made me remember about that because that's probably mm -hmm. the only thing in history I could tell you about was that era because of this that I remember so many years ago. And it impacted me. Because I was able, I finally didn't feel stupid because I understood something in history, the class that I did not like the most. Right. And I felt it was the way that that teacher allowed us to learn the information. Of that course. Able to retain it. There has to be something to that because all the other classes that I had to read. <laughs> of course there is. Well, so here's the thing. So let me, let me piece some of that together for you. And maybe expand on, on the thinking a little bit, because you're right. Experiential learning is is always going to be better in, for most things. Some things are hard to do that way. But there's two things about this that are important to remember. Some things only work in some system, like spelling. It has to be done visually or you're going to make mistakes. Correct because trying to sound it out doesn't work. So with kids who are highly auditory and very gifted that way, we can't give them an auditory strategy that will work because there aren't any. So for them, we have to teach them how to be visual. Mm -hmm. 
at least in that way. So the first thing that I will say is, yes, most of us have some tendency to prefer learning visually or learning auditorily or learning kinesthetically. And the schools have rightly in some cases had to usually by law now come up with accommodations for kids, right? So once they're having trouble reading, they can take the test orally, right? Now, the idea of accommodations is a nice idea, but it's not the answer to the problem. What we need to do is, is help those kids learn to do it visually as well. We've got to teach them all the skills that they're going to need to learn. And that means teaching them to be visual and auditory and kinesthetic. When you get into an experiential learning situation, there's no way to avoid whatever your preferred learning is because they're, they're all there, right? Some kids learn just fine reading the book because they're making the movie. That's what they're doing. So let me give you another, uh, another fun story. A father calls me up one day and says, I've got a seven-year-old, he's in second grade, and he has zero reading comprehension. And I said, zero, okay, that's, that's pretty much zero. He said, right. I said, by zero, what do you mean? He says, well, I give him a comprehension test, he'll read something, then they'll ask him about it. There'll be a bunch of questions. He never gets any of them right. He gets a zero every time on the test. That's I said, really? Yeah. But I said, can he read? He says, that's the funny thing. They can. He's the best reader in his class when he reads out loud. He reads perfectly. And I said, but he doesn't remember anything. He says, right. He gets a zero every time. Right. I said, this is way too cool. you got to bring this child in. I got to see him and bring some of the school books because I got to see how this works. So he brings him in. This child is seven going on like 16. He's so articulate. He's so smart. And he's the sweetest little kid you've ever seen in your life. He was just wonderful. So I said, okay, let's see how this works. So the first book had pictures in it. It was like, you know, a comic book kind of thing. So there's like six, nine pictures on the page and there's a sentence below each one, right? So I said, okay, look at the first picture. And it's a picture of a cow jumping over a fence, simple as it can possibly be. So read what's underneath it. He says, the cow jumped over the fence. Great. What's that mean? I don't know. You know what? I made the same face you just made. I said, well, we'll read it again. The cow jumped over the fence. Very good. You're a really good reader. What's that mean? I have no idea. I went, said, all right, you know what a cow is, right? And he looks at me like I'm an idiot. He says, yes, I know what a cow is. I said, and, and you know what a fence is? And he says, you know, what's, <laughs> come on. I said, all right. I said, can you imagine in your mind a cow jumping over a fence? I said, well, yeah, of course. I said, okay, now read it again. The cow jumped over the fence. What's that mean? I don't know. I said, uh, look at the picture. And he looks at the picture. I swear, I am not making this up. He slaps himself in the head and goes, that's the picture I just made in my head. I went, yeah. He said, that's what the words mean. I said, uh-huh. He said, so that, that's all there is to it? I said, yeah. He, didn't make he, says, he says, why didn't they tell me that? And I said, I, maybe you were absent that day. He said, I don't think so. And then he says, are they all like that? I said, yeah, every one of them. He said, so that's all I got to do? I said, yeah, you just make a picture out of it. Well, I can do that. I said, well, I figured you probably could. Pick up the other book. And the other book didn't have any pictures. Went, opened it up, paragraph at random, read the first sentence. He says, what do we do? I said, we do the same thing we did before. Make the picture in your head of whatever's happening in the, in the sentence. And he does that. He says, okay, now read the second sentence. Okay, and he does that. And I said, now take the first picture and put it up here. A lot of times, as you know, people remember things when it's up and to the left, if it's something visual. That's not everybody, but, but probably 90% of people. So he puts it up there. Take the, the second one, put it up next to that one. There were like five or six sentences. I just had him put them all up in a row. And I said, now I'm going to ask you what you just read to me, but don't look at the book. Just look at the pictures in your head and tell me what you see. 
And what he recited to me was almost verbatim what was in the book. And his dad at this point chimes in and says, you know, I'm not so good. You know, I'm not really so good at reading myself. And I went, great. So here's your exercise for you two. I want you to go home and I want you to practice together. I want you to pick up a book, read a sentence together. And I want each one of you to make the picture, the sounds, the feelings, whatever is in the sentence and compare. Tell each other what you did and practice that a little bit for the next couple of weeks and call me back. So I talked to him again, like just a few days later, maybe 10 days later. He didn't even make it to two weeks. And I said, how has it been going? He said, it's really funny. The next day after we saw you, he had another comprehension test. He got an 85. He said, so he went from zero to 85 overnight. He said, yeah. He says, now he's doing great. He understands everything. I said, well, all he needed to do was do what he needed to do. He wasn't doing the transfer of it's taking almost, the words and making it into the images and making it into the full experience. It's almost like he was doing it, but he didn't know if he was going to be right. If what he was imagining was exactly what he was reading, like he didn't make that association. And once he got the permission, like that's exactly, wait, that's a picture I have. Yeah, that's it. Oh, I'm doing it right. Then I am, I do know how to do it. But I'm going to tell you, that was my issue with reading was comprehension. It's my twins issue with comprehension. They can read. They can sound out the words. They do really great with it. My daughter has more inflection than my son because he still does a lot of the pausing. However, right. they can read. But it's the comprehension when you ask the questions. And here's what I don't get. I can do what you say. Because when I do read, I'm able to put a story in my head visually. However, when you ask me the questions, it's the questions they ask. I'm like, where did that question come from? That's not what I got from it. Because there's also a thing of perception. Is I'm giving the meaning of the book the way I'm understanding it through my filters. Right. You're the same book. You're going to give right. the meaning through your filters. And then the right. person who created the questions off of it are asking through their perception of what they got from that book. So then we get really confused at that point. And especially if the writing is bad. Here's an exercise for you. Go find sometime the next couple of days, go find that old economics textbook that's on the top of a shelf somewhere collecting dust or some other textbook that you, you know, had in college or high school, doesn't matter that you go, you know, you pick it up and you go, life is too short. You put it away, right? Yeah, got some of those. I want you to read it for this. See how many visual, auditory, or kinesthetic words are in what you're reading. If the writing is really bad, there aren't any. They're written in what is called unspecified verbs. It sounds very technical, sounds very intelligent and logical, but there's no meaning there. You have to make your own. I can then, see that. Of course you can. Then pick up a novel or a short story, and you'll see exactly the opposite. Yeah. In almost every sentence, there will be pictures, sounds, and feelings. I, I read an interview once with Stephen King, who's a, a good writer. And he said, if somebody plunks down 22 bucks for a book, the writer should do everything but turn the page for them. And he went on to explain, I have to paint a picture that's as vivid as it can possibly be. And I have to give people the sound of that squeaky door so they can hear it in their head. If I can't give them the mental imagery and those sounds clearly enough, I can't scare them. <laughs> he said, and that's what I want to do. He said, that's my goal. I can't scare them if they don't get it. But the problem is that people who write textbooks aren't writers. They're usually right. professors. They're usually teachers and professors. They haven't been taught to read. That's why we have things like dummies and idiots books. Do you know how they make those books? You know where they come? They don't come out of the blue. The Dummies and Idiots companies, those two publishing companies, they go to the top experts in those fields who have already written a textbook and they lock them away for a month with professional technical editors and they take all that information and distill it into things human beings can understand and they just simply rewrite it. But they make sure they've got experts so the information's correct. You know, Sid, when you're saying this, I'm even going back to, again, my grade school time. And I'm thinking of my textbooks when we had reading textbooks, which we, they don't have now, right? Now yeah. my kids get to choose a book that they want to read and then they can answer questions on it. But even the textbooks, like a reading textbook would say, 
there was this big, beautiful island. So in my mind, I had to figure out what does a beautiful and what does a big island even look like? Especially if you've never seen one, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and so, exactly even, right. so what you're saying is even the reading books did not give enough description to say there was these tall trees that had these pine cones on them. They were larger right. than life and they took up the big space on that one island. And you now can hear the birds squawking right. in the distance and the and waves the lapping up at the shore. Right. Sure. Then all of a sudden, because that's how it is now. Like when you read a book now, it's different. Like I remember, you know, the first book I ever read from cover to cover was Flowers in the Attic by B.C. Andrews. Okay. And it, I was so proud of myself, number one, because I actually read a book finally, and I was 16 years old. Yeah. Number two, that I actually remembered the story. Like, I could tell you what the story, to this day, I could tell you what the story is. You know, then I read um, Red Dragon and Signs of the Lambs, and I was, like, intrigued by it. Now I was on a roll. But here's one thing that my kids say to me also, and I, and I can feel this, is that it takes so long to read a book. So the bigger the book was, the more I didn't want to read it. Give right. me a small book with 20 pages. I'll read it. That's why my book that I wrote, um, Teach Your Children That They're Enough, is like 25 pages. It's an easy yes. read. It gives you the information you need. It's descriptive. You understand it. You can relate like, yeah, that's my kid in there. Like, she's writing about yeah. my kid. That's yeah. what I made my book about. Because if I couldn't understand it, then how do I expect the world to understand what I'm trying to say? Well, that's right. And my books are longer but they're real easy to read on purpose. You know, people have said to me for years, you know, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, a lot of people have difficulty understanding NLP. They have difficulty understanding the principles. Well, that's because of the way it's taught. And they always tell me, you explain it so clearly. And I tell them the simple truth. I'm kind of a simpleton. So if I can't make it simple, I can't understand it. And here's what I do. I give it to people the way I understand it. Teaching to me means taking the pictures, sounds, and feelings that I have and putting them in your head. I love that. And making sure that you can see the same pictures, the same sounds, and the same feelings. And that's the problem with the books that are badly written. You have to guess what the pictures and the sounds and the feelings are that the author has. Now, here's the other thing that I'll tell you. What you described earlier your your ability to learn from experiential learning is kind of the opposite end of what we're talking about with reading. So when you're reading something, you have to take out the pictures, sounds, and feelings and put them in your head and then be able to manipulate them. When you're in experiential learning, they're giving you the pictures, sounds, feelings, tastes, and smells, so they go right in. That's why it's so easy, right? Here's the other piece, too. I don't know if you've ever studied um, discovery learning, discovery-based learning. So here's the way, and, and tell me if this isn't true for you. And I think everybody out there is going to have had this experience. You're going through life and you find something out on your own. You just discover something. So, oh, that's how that works. So that's how people communicate, whatever it might be. And then later on, somebody tells you about it and you go, yeah, that's my experience too. And you get to talk about it. And then they'll say, oh, there's a book on this, or there's an article you should read that explains it even more. And then you go read that. And it, it's an easy way to learn. It's a natural way to learn. And that kind of learning sticks with us. What do we do in school? Read it first, then talk about it, then put it into some kind of practice. We do it backwards. backwards. We're teaching things in the wrong order. Give people the experience first, then yeah. help them together then they'll already have the experience then you can have them read about it right we're talking about it afterwards right so i we're running out of time but Sid, i would love to have you back because i feel like there's so much more to extract but here's here's my biggest takeaway from what you said um especially because i'm i'm, I'm gonna really chew on that my kids are doing dyslexia they don't have dyslexia and i really like that and i, I, I want to explore that more and, and your husband too <laughs> yeah my husband too and what here's what i got from you is Get my kids to be comfortable, get them to relax, to breathe, find three or four things that they know that they're good at, you know, that they feel good about that. Build that confidence up in them and then ask them to kind of like take a breath and just read, but read slower and, 
and 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 tell me what you're seeing in the corner you know up up there up, up above right. you. and let's see if they can actually get success now because that's what they need. And share what you see correct share it. yeah do that's it together important. Do it so together. I, I love that. I think that is gold. And you gave so many other gold nuggets. And I appreciate that, um, what, what you've given our listeners. Thank you so much for taking time. Again, I would love to have you back because I'd love to go to part two with Sid Jacobson. So we Vino, can Vino I, I, I've got parts three, four, six, and eight, 12, and 37 all ready to go. So I could do this all day long. We just did this much of what I was going to cover. So, <laughs> so we're, we're golden. And I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. I love much. it. I love it. Thank you so much. If you're finding value in this conversation here on our show, please join our Redefined Parenting group on Facebook for even more tips and conversations. Uh, please check out Sid Jacobson too. He has his Facebook group as well on um, there. And Sid, what was that? Well, group? Teaching and learning for parents. Teaching learning for parents. So you can get even more gold from this amazing man. Um, thank you so much again for joining in our conversation. Our uh, resource is the ebook. There's a QR code there. Please get my ebook. Teach your children that they're enough. This show can also be heard on Spanish Radio Network. Please check out SpanishWorld.ca for all your news and programming. Spanish World, watch it, hear it, read it, download it, and live it.